So uh, I think that will be, I think that's definitely, it, we definitely need to talk about that uh, in detail. And after that, we're going to talk about outlier detection. So um, as I briefly explained in the introduction, and uh, so the associated rule binding is something to do to say, to de device, to come up with the rules. Uh, the example that I gave, like diaper, if you say people uh, buy diaper in the supermarket, market, it's very likely they're going to buy beer as well. And you know, people find well, people find that <coughs> pattern and try to give it an uh, interpretation. <coughs> it's quite an interesting story. It's also uh, you know, figure out why. But I, I talked to the people uh, in Dark Hobby, who's a uh, who's company actually uh, designed this, uh, uh, what was it? The Rorik car for Tesco, and he said, is this, this is untrue, at least in, uh, in Tesco. But certainly, there's other interesting findings by using uh, associated dividing. So uh, the, the problem is here is you you give the set of records. Let's say in this uh, supermarket, you have this past purchase transactions, and so those records, for each of the records, which contain some number of items, right? Which basically say, okay, these are the stuff that I that I bought today. Uh, here, let's say you've got five transactions. Um, so each transaction might belong to different people, but you can see you can at least see the concurrence of the items by looking at these those transactions, and then. The data associated rule binding task, in fact, is to produce the dependency rules, which will predict occurrence of item, given the occurrence of the other items. For example, say, I'm going to find this from here. Can I sort of find a pattern that, you know, if you have a, if you purchase diapers, then you'll be very highly probable you're going to buy beer as well. Or if you have the beer, bread, uh, purchase beer bread in your transaction, very likely the milk will be there as well. So, bear in mind that when I say concurrence, concurrence, it's nothing more than that. It doesn't mean, say, give the reason like I have, because I buy beer bread, so I buy milk. There's nothing about causality there. Um, so here is that the question, in fact, compared to machine learning, is it's quite different. Before you think about if I you know, people that people buy this, what probability they're going to buy that? It's a probability casting, uh, uh, probability. Uh, you could use the probability to ca calculate that probability, and that, that's it. But Given a large amount of data, it's very difficult to find those rules, find those dominant uh, rules. So that be become uh, not really accuracy problem, but it's more or less uh, the efficiency problem. So that's data mining is very interesting. Uh, here is that the question, the first, before we look at the algorithm, the first thing we do understand is how can we use the discovery solution? Why that is useful uh, in the practice? So let's say here you have you have the discovery. If you have diaper associated with certain stuff then you want to buy beer. Uh, if you have that, what you can actually have is that if you look at this beers as a result, uh, and you could actually think, okay, if I want to boost the sale of beers, what are those items I should pay attention to? So this basically would help you. Those position rules would help you do that. So equally, you can look at the other way around. Look at this diaper and say, 
what if the typer is discontinued? Uh, setting, basically the store is discontinued setting the uh, diaper in the supermarket, what would be the consequence, right? So if you have that rule, set of rules, then you might be able to identify those consequences. And also we can look at this diaper and beers and say, okay, what would be these products that I can put it together with diapers so that I would be able to uh, promote sale of beers. So that might be the third question that you could uh, you'll be able to answer from the, the association rule that you buy from the data. Um, before we talk about algorithm, the first is we're going to talk about some of the concepts uh, in associated rule item. The frequent item set is this you would have uh, the item set basically is a collection of one or more items. For example, milk, bread, diaper is is a uh, is an item is an item set. So key item set is basically that you the item set contains key items. And the support uh, the support count is that we need to find what with the what with the frequent item set uh, in the in our collection. So we could use a uh, support count as an indication how frequent that is. For example, in this case, we have an item set, milk, bread, diaper. And look at this, uh, in this collection, uh, we could actually find that the, count, the support count, in fact, is uh, two, because let's say the traffic ID five, uh, trans transaction ID 4, where you find that milk, bread, diaper occurs together. So out of five, there are, there are two times this item set occurs. So that means this uh, support count is two. And the support, in fact, is a fraction of transactions that contain the item set. Uh, well, it's obviously because here we have five transactions and you calculate the support is uh, two out of five. So the support here, from the probabilistic pro pro perspective, what does support mean? <coughs> if I ask you what the support uh, box probability, in fact, you calculate it. Um, so the fraction of transactions that contain the item set. What does it mean? In a, in a progressive, the progress way, what does it mean? So can I say this support is a probability that these two items would occur together? In a given three, the, three items? Three yeah. items, milk, yeah. bread, diaper would occur in a, in a record. The yes. probability that three items would occur in a record. From, from the five records we have here. Yes, so that's basically that what support means. Probabilistically, it means that the probability that these three items uh, gonna occur in a uh, in a record. That's it. So it's simple as that. It's not really uh, something complicated. It's, it's just joint probability of these two of these three uh, items. Any question? Uh, so uh, in order to find the 
rules that are that are meaningful, or you want to find the rules that are significant or, or representative. Uh, we we need to say okay, that item set has to be frequent, right? If it's not really occurs too much, too many terms in the in the collection, uh, even you have the rules, the rules that really represent a pattern. Uh, in, in the in the collection. So here he says we have the frequent items that we can define as that we're gonna specify this minimum support threshold we need to have. And say okay the frequent set has to have the support which is greater than a certain threshold that you select. So the the minimum the minimum um, support Minimum support is the threshold that is is this parameter that is set about. You set it up uh, when you do the associated rule. Uh, so the associated rule, in fact, is that it's an implication expression. Uh, let's say if you have x, they imply y. So the x, y are the item sets. It's a set of items, basically. In this case, milk diaper, they apply the bin. And uh, the rule evaluation matrix or the criteria to be uh, a rule that you obtain uh, is that support. You can check whether the support uh, is bigger than a certain threshold and the confidence is bigger than the threshold. The confidence is another measure which measure how often item in Y uh, P is trying to check the deck of the X. So which is which basically if you look at is the support of the three items together, X, Y together, and divided by this, the support uh, of the support count of the, the two items that uh, in the front, which is uh, uh, in this case is uh, is a milk kind of diaper. So basically this is the X and this is X plus Y. So can I ask <coughs> what the confidence here? What confidence measure here? What probability the confidence in fact measures? So I basically the confidence is that <coughs> In this case, milk diaper here, um, I have the support count for milk diaper beer together, x, y together, and divided by the support for milk diaper, uh, the x. Something to do with condition probability, isn't it? What do I measure? <coughs> What does this 2 over 3 mean? 2 over 3 means? Given we have the milk and diaper, what's the probability to uh, observe here? Mm -hmm. So given that, that you have milk and diaper in the, in the record, what is the probability that uh, B will be there, right? Yeah, that's correct. So it's a conditional probability, uh, saying that if I observed <coughs> beer and diaper uh, in the record, for example, in this transaction, uh, let's say transaction five, transaction four, and transaction beer time. I said three, right? All of this, all of these three uh, transactions, uh, two times where BS occurs as well. So that's conditional probability. So the task is quite seems quite easy, obvious. You calculate support confidence, and then the, the, the card is of and that's the rule that you want to get. So. <coughs> 
the tax, more specifically the tax, is that give a set of transactions. And the goal is that you find all the rules that having the support figure the, the parameter, the threshold is specified. The confidence is bigger than the minimum confidence threshold that is specified. Why is difficult? You just calculate two probability, joint probability, conditional probability, right? And you see measure that is uh, whether it's is big enough, but that's it. <coughs> However, <coughs> given the large amount of data, it's very difficult to number one, you need you need to list all the possible association rules. And then for each of the association rules, you need to calculate support confidence. Right? And you can examine whether the support component would be higher than the threshold that you set it up. So computationally, it's very, very expensive. So the task, the usual task here is, that is really to find computationally tractable solutions. So here, in fact, you can, you can see the, 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 per, the, the aspect or perspective compared to the machine learning. So machine learning is more interesting in, okay, what would be the, what would be the calculation I should come up with, such that the rule would be sensible, right? Whereas here, data mining is really to, to look at a computational issue, to see computationally whether it's tractable. So the, the, normally they are they have this different sort of focus, but nothing to say that right, you know machine learning is, they, they don't they don't look at a computational issue, whereas data mining doesn't look at this uh, uh, you know prediction issue. Uh, but in general, it, it, it's uh, that's a that's a that's a difference. Uh, so here example, where you have this uh, set of transactions. And this is an example of the rules that you would come up with. And you have ob ob some observations. If you look at those rules, and they are in fact a binary partition of the same item set, milk diaper uh, diaper And rules if you look at this. They definitely think about this. The, the, the support are confident. The support, if you remember, support is the joint probability of the item set in X and the Y, right? Item sets put together. So <coughs> because they are binary partition of the same item set, therefore for the, for those, the support are the same. But the confidence have different uh, have a different value. Look at this. All the support is 0 0.4, where uh, the confident varies. So this basically gives us uh, a hint that we can, in fact, to decouple the problem to calculate support and confidence, right? Because for those we just do one calculation, we'll get our, our support. Whereas for each individual ones, we get companies separately. Therefore, we might reduce some of the uh, competition cost. And so, let's look at a two step. Let's first look at this uh, frequent item set generation. So what what we're gonna do is at first we're gonna look at those rules or looking at those frequent uh, item set so that they will fulfill the requirement of the support, right? For all these uh, frequent items, for all the other set, this would have a smaller, uh, you know, smaller support than what we specified. We could delete them, we could remove them without further consideration. And then for those frequent uh, item sets, we're going to further to find the confidence. 
right? If, for example, here, if you examine this support, power support is 0 0.5, and those is, and you, 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 without looking at confidence, you can remove all these uh, rules because the support 0 0.4 is lower than the, uh, the threat property specified. So this is basically the idea. Um, and so the step is, first we're going to find a frequent item set. We could generate frequent item set. And then once we have that, we're going to say among those uh, frequent item set, we're going to generate high frequent rules for those frequent item set. And those rules are is in fact a binary partition of this uh, of a frequent item set we get. So then we, let, let's look at the first part. So again, it turns out this frequent item set generation is still competition with quite expensive. Um, to see why it's expensive is that what you need to come with is uh, you need to come with all possible candidates. So let's say bread, bread milk combination, bread milk diaper combination, bread a cook, or you know, any combination of these items could be a potential candidate of uh, item set. And then you obviously go through those those uh, transactions to calculate their uh, support and to count the support. So you need to have this and compare with individual transactions. Competition is very expensive. Um, so what you can do? You can you can do obviously you can reduce the number of candidates, right? Um, so you can have a bit of best to, to find out if you do that com complete search, which is uh, two power of d, uh, the number of number of candidates that you can come across. So each item set you have the item there or not, therefore uh, two choices. You have a d as a d number of uh, items. Actually. So uh, you, you can you can use some technique to reduce to to m. And also need to reduce the number of comparisons. You need to compare with all possible candidates and with uh, the item set. And that we can, we can find a way to uh, to reduce the number of comparisons. What we can do, we can do cover with a structure. Cover with a clever structure, data structure, to store these candidates and transactions such a way that we don't need to match every candidate against any transaction. So therefore, it's going to reduce competition. So, uh, so here, to get an idea about number of candidates item we could generate. Suppose you've got these uh, uh, four items, A, B, C, D, E. And this is basically all the possible item set you could, you could generate. And uh, one interesting thing that you can find is that if, let's say, A, B is frequent, then anything, then all of his subsets must also be frequent. So if A, B is frequent, obviously A will be frequent. B will be frequent as well, right? If, let's say if A, B occurs twice in the collection, the A will be at least occurs twice in the collection, obviously. Equally for B. Uh, so in, in other words, what we'll translate is that if you find an uh, item which item set is infrequent, that all of these supersets can be removed, can be proved. So this is basically what, what, what I said, is that if you find, okay, A, B is, if I use A, B to construct my item set, the support that I calculate is smaller than the threshold that I, want, that I need. And I don't need to consider the rest of the item set, anything because they're definitely going to be smaller 
the, the, the threat will consent to specify. So simple as that. But once you have that, you can actually reduce, significantly reduce your competition. When you can compare, get rid of A, B, then you get rid of everything. Rebuilding, rebuilding ones, which competitive. So, so a prior algorithm, a prior algorithm, in fact, is the is one of first is it well, is the the first uh, associated rebuilding algorithm. In fact, to take a advantage of that, is what you can do is that we start with uh, k equal to one, like I said, so just have one item in the item set. And we generate the frequent item set of item one. So we basically look at those item sets to see which one is to get to get the frequent items where the support will be higher than our threshold. For something smaller than that, we gotta remove it. And also his super set gotta remove as well. And so what the, the the procedure is as follows. Then we go finish off e equal to one. Then we go to uh, k equal to one. We could go to k equal to two. Looking at two items in one set, in one in one set, yeah. And they again to look at where they, they are frequent or not. And the proven item sets contain a subset of the lens k that is efficient. So that being said. If the, we identify these items, uh, the, the the items that are infrequent, the subset of them they are already infrequent in the previous row, we're gonna remove that without calculation because the support will definitely will be smaller as well. Will be small as well. Will be smaller than this threshold. Uh, so we do that. We basically do the pooling, and therefore. Eliminate these candidates that are already frequent. We don't really need to handle it. So here is a uh, suppose that minimum support we have is three, or minimum support count is three. And we start with uh, the items, one single item in the set. So if you look at here, the cook, X, the support they have is two and one. And they are smaller than three. So we obviously can remove them. And then in the following calculation, any uh, item set which contain Coke or X, we can immediately remove. So in this case, when we generate two items, item sets, we're not going to generate the, the item set where Coke and X occurs. So in this case, we're not going to eliminate all possible item sets. We move code and X. And here we do this, uh, you know, counting calculation to find that bread, beer, milk, beer, they are uh, infrequent. Or, and then when we go to the three item sets, so we need to no need to generate candidates involve code X and the bread beer or <coughs> milk beer as well. And then it, 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 it now turns out to be we only have one uh, item set involved three items. So that significantly reduce our calculation. So here is a bit of uh, you know, calculation that we have. If you consider all possible subsets, if you don't consider Um, so this is the the way to prove these uh, the candidates candidate item set. And as I said, it also can reduce the number of comparisons by looking at by coming with a uh, you know um, a special local data structure. So. One way you can do that is using a hash, hash structure. Um, so instead of match each transaction against every candidate, you match it against the candidate contained in the hash uh, <coughs> buckets. So that means you you've got to create a tree. You only compare the sub 
set of the subset of the item set or subset of transactions that will significantly reduce the competition. Uh, so here example. You first, let's say you have five candidate item set of event three. Uh, look at here, we order this uh, this item set. I will show why. I will show later why we need to order them. So the hash function, if, if you understand, if you remember when we talk about inverting decks, we're talking about hash function. So hash function, in fact, is is a map from the key to the associated value. So you have the key, and you would guarantee that you will get the associated value. Um, so it's here we're going to hash is hash the tree. So once the number comes in, we take the mode of this number. So that if it's a, if the mode is 1, 4, 7, we're going to uh, have put here. Put here, you know, if this this mode is 2, 5, 8, we're going to put something in the um, If it's zero rest, we're going to put it in the, in the right. So by doing this, we can actually create a tree to store these item sets we, we have in our candidates, uh, in our candidate list. Mm -hmm. So here is an example. So these are the ones that hash on 147. Uh, these are the ones that has hash on 258, and these are the items that hash on 369. Um, once you have that, uh, Okay, once you have that, what you need is that you need to have this similar structure for the items in the transaction. Because in the transaction, you need to come in with a subset and compare with a uh, with, uh, candidate set to see whether there's a match. Right? There's a match, and there's one support. So, uh, so obviously, one task you need to come up with is that you need to come in with a to generate a subset. So here is a way to generate uh, to remove the redundancy. In fact, here we also order these transaction records based on the item ID. So in this case, one, two, three, five, six. And so we could generate, say, in this case, here an example to generate these. Uh, subset uh, which contains three items. So you could generate follow follow the protocol here. Say so in level one, saying that okay, what I'm gonna generate item set start with item one. If I start with item one, here I have three choices. Uh, the, the first choice and the second one, I'm gonna start with item two. And this is a choice I'm going to start with item 3, and this is a choice I'm going to start with item 5. If I start with item 1, 5, uh, the only set I'm going to generate is 1, 5, 6. So you can do this. Uh, for the rest of the options, and these are the item sets, subsets you could generate. And you're obviously, you're going to use this to compare with the three sets items, uh, so three item sets in the candidate uh, list. Uh, so you can do this uh, by using hash function. So what you can do is that in the transaction you can do the same trick uh, by applying this the hash function here to store your subset uh, for the exactly same problem. Once you have, then you would only compare 
once you reach to the leaves, you only compare the leaves that uh, the you know the the item set in the leaves and do the proper comparison. Therefore, you don't uh, you don't need to compare the rest of these uh, item set in the candidate list. So by doing this, it significantly reduce the reduce the calculation. So basically, to the match here and the rest you don't. So that is a way to reduce the reduce the competition. So anyway, so this is sort of a technique that you can use use to pooling the uh, the comparison. Um, any question about that? <coughs> okay, so once once you have this again, so here's is just one uh, example to show you how to sort of uh, reduce the uh, comparison. But there are other techniques as well. But uh, the, the they have this uh, the similar principle that you first to eliminate, remove some of these, uh, uh, remove the level of candidate items in the list. And also we remove, uh, reduce some of the uh, comparisons. Once you have a frequent set of frequent item sets, uh, then the next task is to do generation. Basically, is to calculate uh, these uh, the confidence, right? Uh, for example, here, if you have a frequent set A, B, C, D is a frequent item set, you could generate the following rules. So, again, this competition is quite expensive. It's a uh, so here is that basically say that if you the length is K. That there's a, a two to the power of k minus two candidate so to lose, uh, which you can you can easily work out because that uh, so in each position you have a binary case whether it's there or not. So for each item, you have the decision whether this is uh, as uh, put on the front or put on the back, and then you obviously have k choices uh, because you put this you can all this. Empty set to the front, you have to the empty set uh, at the end, therefore, you minus two. So that's basically is the number of candidate associated rules that you have to come up with. Uh, again, you, you, you can have uh, a way to uh, prove those rules that might not necessary to be might not necessary to be, uh, you don't need to examine it. Uh, you can actually remove it, if not resolve, even examine it, because here is a property. Uh, it's the following. So if you have this frequent set, the confidence of uh, A, B, C imply D would be higher than A, B imply C. And would be higher than A by B C D. So that means if you have more items in the beginning, uh, then that would have more confident value, higher confident value, then you have more items at the end. So again here what 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 is the reason? Yeah, yes, why? Think about the conditional probability. So remember the component is a conditional probability. You can do the calculation yourself by looking at this collision probability and see whether you know, that's the case or not. Um, 
So what you could do is, based on these rules, you could in fact to to remove some of these uh, rules. So if you find that B, C, D imply A in fact has no complement rules, then you could remove the remaining ones as well, because there's these confidence will definitely would be smaller than that or equal. Certainly would be would be higher than that. So that's the way you can actually remove uh, some of the rules without really bother to calculate the the confidence. So this this is um, Again, here is a very simple technique you can use. Uh, there's uh, more advanced ones, uh, but given the limit of time, uh, we don't really have, uh, we're not able to uh, introduce here. But I think you would get a general idea about what is associated in the room and how can you able to come in with a basic method for that. Um, what I what I'm going to talk about now is the evaluation. This evaluation is, is something very important because once you have generated rules, they not necessarily the rules will be correct. Simply because you just, just rely on confidence, just rely on support, that's not necessary. They are not necessary to tell the full story about what happens in the data. Um, and also in practice, if you're just using the social rule algorithms, sometimes it's really to generate too many rules at the same time. So you, you, some of them are really redundant, some of them are not interesting. And uh, for example, here, that uh, these two examples, ABC, Pi B, AB, Pi B, if they have the same support company, perhaps one of them would be really redundant. And uh, so there, as I said, only using support confidence you can have, they are not enough. What we need is that perhaps we need to come up with more measures. So interesting, interesting this measure uh, is one of them that can be used, in fact, to, to measure whether the rules that are generated is interesting or not. Uh, so here's a general picture of, of a data mining uh, task. You start with a select a data, for instance, select data set. And then you come in with some pre-processing of the data. And then you do the mining, find the patterns. For the pattern to uh, knowledge, you need to have some post-processing to say integrate that pattern, whether that's true or not, whether that indeed it does represent some knowledge that we don't know or not. Uh, the interesting, uh, interesting these measures are they, are they can be used in different stage. You could use it in the beginning, perhaps to filter out some of the data. Uh, you can, uh, during the process, you can use it as a measure or as a criteria, uh, material. And then perhaps in the post uh, processing stage, and you would be able to use it as a as a metric, as a criteria, or as a metric. <coughs> as, let's see how to calculate interesting these metrics. Uh, suppose we have a rule x imply y. Uh, if it only interesting these two, <coughs> two upon x and y, you can come up with a contingency table. Uh, remember that we've been talking about uh, PM25 uh, model. We also have the contingency table, where there's a, a remember here as a random given term, whether relevant or not, given term, whether the term occurs there or not. And then you, and you kept coming with a uh, probability estimation. Equally here is that you also will opposition you can summarize of optimism, uh, uh, summarize 
that your data into this contiguous detail to understand the relationship between these the two variables in this case. Uh, in fact, <coughs> most of the measures like support, confidence, um, and, and other you know, measures, they derived from this thing. And uh, <coughs> here is uh, the drawback. If you're coming with the rule, uh, it's not necessarily you know, represent something meaningful. For example, given this table, you in fact when you calculate the rule like T imply coffee, you look at this, the confidence that you calculated is 0 0.75. What does it mean? Is, is it very high, is it? 0 0.75 that uh, does it mean that if you drink tea, you will drink coffee? Well, the data we find out here with the general rule, which is say, uh, the, the, the confidence of tea generate coffee is 0 0.7, 0 0.75. Does that imply that? Probably not. Even though you have very high confidence, the fact is that if you look at the probability of coffee drink, drinker at 0 0.9, which is higher than the confidence that you have. Therefore, compare with this two, you can actually find that a person is a drink tea drinker actually decrease decreases um, her probability of being a coffee drinker compared to this uh, prior probability of a coffee drinker. Whereas you can see, if you have not a coffee, it's not a tea drinker, you find the probability actually is higher than that. So that suggests that, in fact, drinking tea is negatively correlated with drinking coffee not the area around. But from the associated rule binding, the confidence is pretty high that it's really, uh, you might draw a different conclusion. So that exa particular example um, shows that when you you keep using associated rule binding, you need to be, really uh, be careful about the interpretation you would come up with. In some situations, you have high confidence that not necessarily say, uh, drinking tea is positive correlated with, uh, with drinking coffee. Uh, so one way to do that is perhaps to examine is to, to whether example, example whether statistically x, y, they are dependent or they are independent. So one way to calculate is the, suppose you have a population of 100, 1,000 users. And then you know, 600 students know how to swim. Uh, 700 students know how to how to bike. And you know, about 400 students know how to swim and uh, swim and bike. You can calculate this. Uh, for example, you calculate joint probability. You calculate collision probability. And you can calculate this marginal probability as well. You we'll find that this joint probability. It's in fact equal to the um, this marginal probability uh, put it together. So one way you could check whether these two events, let's say, know how to swim and know how to bike, is statistically independent or not. You could calculate the joint probability, and you could calculate this marginal probability and multiply together to see whether they are equal or not. And if this joint would be bigger than the individual one put together, it's positively correlated. If it's not, perhaps it's negatively correlated. So this is the way you can examine this. By calculating this, you can actually look at this tea or coffee where positively correlated or negatively correlated. 
he was drinking tea and you know drinking coffee is negative correlated in this case perhaps you should remove the confidence perhaps you should remove the rule because the rule doesn't really tell anything so there are other measures as well like linked interest interest is what, what we just said it's, uh, it's always the same and then you have other measures as well which actually help you to uh, to you know to examine whether the generated rules is meaningful and uh, so if you calculate the lift here is a smaller one there means this it's negative correlated so perhaps the rules here is not meaningful so that's the way to help you to do the uh, to exact generated rule. and again uh, those measures those measures also have some problems. So here are these two tables. If you look at these two tables, I didn't change anything. I just swap the data between uh, y and y hat, x and x hat. The portion, I didn't change anything. I just swap this. You can see the lift, the value calculated is completely different. So that basically says there's, there's no free range. There's no wish free range. If you use some measure, you definitely need to know what is the drawback of that. And very clear mind what this measure can do and what this measure can what this measure can So in the past period people in the, you know previously proposed a lot of measures. Look at this, I've got twenty one measures here. And some are better quite good in certain situations, some measures are bad. In, you know, in other situations. So, and I said there's no free that to really to understand this and think about in what situation you want to use. Sometimes you need to use multiple situations. No worry, that won't be that exact. <laughs> <laughs> if, if they do, I, I probably need to, I, I'm, I'm going to define that. <laughs> so make sure you don't need to remember it at least. No, at least they provide a formula sheet at yeah. the end of the paper. Yeah. Any question about the matter for social providing? Okay, for the remaining uh, 30 minutes, probably it's only 20 minutes, I think, uh, we're going to quickly go through this outlier detection, um, some of the techniques there. Um, it's, it's, um, it's quite popular because in, uh, in many situations, you need to uh, have so-called anomaly detection where uh, you want to detect this uh, strange behavior. So it's basically you want to detect significant deviation from the normal behavior. Uh, for example, you want to detect credit card fraud, credit card fraud. You want to detect that one intrusion, uh, intrusion. So that's, we, we talk about application of classification, classifier, right? We said the credit card fraud detection that can be formulated as as uh, as classification problem. However, um, in some cases, you can't if you have the negative trend example, meaning that you you have you, you in the past you know for this kind of transaction, it is fraud. It was fraud for this type of transaction. Therefore, you would be able to build a classifier for that. But in some cases, you probably don't even have a trading data. When I say trading data, you don't even have a label. You have the historic transaction, but perhaps you don't really know whether the historical transaction, those transactions, what are the genuine ones, what are the faulty ones. Uh, so what we need is that we're going to detect abnormal behavior in the data. So that's the difference between anomaly detection or outline detection between, uh, and classification problem. So the question we are interested in is that are there any, are there any outliers 
So in this whole universe of user behaviors, are there any strange behavior, behavior going on there? Something different with the majority. And uh, so it's very challenging problem because you don't you have no idea how many authorized are there, right? There's no form uh, criteria for that. Uh, the method is unsupervised uh, because you don't have a training data. It's unsupervised. Uh, and the validation measure, are you coming with a proper measure to measure how successful your technique is? It's really difficult. It's quite similar to like uh, uh, to the clustering problem, where you don't really have uh, ground truths to measure uh, to to against to compare with. So um, here, in order to make it work, in order to derive a sensible algorithm, what you need is that you need to have assumption here. The assumption here is that in most of the cases is that there are considerable more normal observation. Whereas in global ones, we are really they are they contain the data. But the number of these global observations they are in fact is not too many. So with this assumption that able to allow us to come up with a model to be able to do that. Uh, think about what the simple approach. Simple approach will be uh, you you plot the data, right? You could see, okay, this is something strange. This guy did a, something wrong in here. I'm gonna look at that. What this guy doing? So you could be able to immediately say uh, the difference between a normal behavior and a normal behavior. Uh, but it's time consuming, obviously, and it's quite subjective. Yeah, uh, so the one thing I forgot to mention is that, okay, based on assumption, what we can have is that we're going to build this uh, profile of normal behavior, right? Because we have a lot of data there. So they are able to get a reasonably good a model, a profile of this normal behavior. And we're going to look at this abnormal one to see you know, whether they're likely to be generated from the normal one or not. And therefore, if it's not, then perhaps that is a normal one. Uh, yeah. So there's a statistical approach. You can use a graph, but this there's also a statistical approach is that you can calculate the statistics to conduct statistical tests. Uh, if you still remember, we Emily um, she uh, talked about a bit about significance tests. T test, p value, so on and so forth, which in, in fact is quite similar to uh, what we're going to talk about here. Is that you come in with a hypothesis. So here is that you say there's no outline the data, and there's at least one outline the data, and you're going to test hypothesis which one is correct. So what you can do is that. The first uh, assume that the data comes from the normal distribution. Therefore, it's your uh, new hypothesis. And you come in with uh, this uh, test. It's called Scrum's test. It's not P-test, but it's a different one. It's a test. You could have the data, you calculate the statistics, and see the statistics whether it's bigger than you know the, the threshold here or not. And if if this is correct, you're going to reject the hypothesis, uh, meaning that there is an outline there. And therefore, you can pick up that outline. So by doing this, you could sort of intuitively pick up this outline until this hypothesis, new hypothesis, is correct, that there's no outline anymore. So basically, that split the normal behavior and outline. But this test does have a very strong uh, assumption. They assume that you know it's a univariate uniwear, data. Um, so these are 
uh, you know, these are parameters in the, in the, in the T distribution. It would be rather hard to do the calculation. Another way is the lucky fruit. So we briefly mentioned the lucky fruit function. So it's not true from is that you get the evidence data and to see the model, how likely the, 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 the data generated with that model. And using the likelihood to do the proper assessment about the model, whether the model is correct or not. So here is that you have a data set. And you basically say now, OK, in the data set, there are some samples from uh, normal behavior. There are also some samples that contain, you know, strange abnormal, abnormal behavior. And you basically say, again, assume all the data set belong to uh, normal behavior. They are normal behavior. And then you build a likelihood function. Okay, then you can basically try each possible um, samples to see, move that to to A, to basically that A is uh, this abnormal uh, distribution. And the calculate this likelihood. And see the likelihood, whether you're able to improve, improve the likelihood. If you improve the likelihood, that means that the body moved to that normal one, it is a fit to the abnormal uh, you know, profile. So this is a sort of uh, uh, question you could come up with. So um, in short, is that the data, in fact, is a mixture distribution of normal behavior and abnormal behavior. And again, therefore, based on that, you can build a logical function, where it contains normal ones, abnormal ones, and then you take a logarithm that you get this uh, the formula. And then you're able to say, put this thing, put a sample here, put a sample here, and to see which, uh, to see whether the likelihood, uh, to calculate the likelihood function. And using it as a criteria to decide what sample belongs to the lower behavior, what sample belongs to the uh, lower so this, the, 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 the problem of, of those statistical approaches is obviously they have some assumption about the, the structure of the data. And, and in most of the cases, those, those distributions we are not really known uh, before that. And in most of also the data are quite dimensional. So it's very difficult to, to, to estimate the true distribution. Um, but what you can do is using uh, distant data approaches. Like you look at construct neighborhood, uh, nearest neighborhood based uh, clustering uh, approaches. Uh, so you could calculate the distance between two pairs of data. And you can define, whereas we define the outliers, right? For the, uh, for the ones that, if it's, you can define that if they don't, this guy doesn't have too many labels, then perhaps that's the outlier. <coughs> So you can, again, using the clustering uh, techniques we talked about, cluster data first. I look at those points that doesn't be good to any of the cluster, or this cell created become a cluster. And perhaps those are the outliers. Um, so this is the last lecture, last slides of today's lecture. Um, Obviously, we don't really talk, talk about all the techniques uh, about data mining. Um, here are the, some of the references. Um, so the data mining in general, you can look at a book. And uh, for the class B and class B regression, you can look at this uh, machine learning uh, literature. And so this is the, uh, the data mining, association with, my, association with mining. Uh, paper. If you're interested in the, uh, the research paper on the how they properly come up with the idea, how properly evaluate, it, that, that's something uh, you can look at. Uh, 
Yes, that's 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 pretty well for Hughes. Uh, do you have any any questions about Sunday's lecture? Okay, so see you guys next Friday. So next Friday, uh, what I need again is these four or five slides. Uh, presentation.